parameters because it's possible and well, always the case, that we don't represent the geologic system completely correctly. And so we might have this unit T2 be too narrow, or it might be truncated. And that would result in effective parameters for those units, which then, given that structure and those parameters, when we go to make predictions, may not relate to what actually happens in the field system. Let me show you this sum of squared weighted residual surface as an oblique view here just so that I can move on and show you a couple other situations. For example, if our data has error associated with it, then this distinct minimum starts to disappear. As a matter of fact, this surface may become so flat that many, many parameter values essentially give you the same fit to the data. Another problem arises if we only use, say, one type of data. So for the groundwater model, if we use only heads and leave out the flow, then this surface has a long, narrow trough on it. And we can only estimate the ratio of T1 and T2 and not their absolute values. So for one, we should consider useful models are those that are calibrated with accurate observations and use many types of data. Now sometimes our objective function surface is very complex and it's challenging to find the minimum. So that there are other methods besides nonlinear regression that we might use to find that minimum. Things like function approx approximation, shuffle complex evolution, genetic algorithms, simulated annealing. And some software that I'll talk to you about at the end of this presentation is oriented towards getting these methods into the hands of the practitioners and allowing us all to evaluate their, their value. Now I'm digressing a little bit. I want to mention that if you want to learn more about calibration or predictive uncertainty, there's a textbook by Mary Hill and Claire Tiedemann called Effective Groundwater Model Calibration that's uh, coming out from Wiley in January of 2007. And I encourage you to learn more about this process. And this is a nice book because you can sit down and teach yourself using it. So I hope that with this small nutshell overview, I've been able to convince you that it's currently impossible to fully characterize a groundwater system, or if we could, that it would be impossible to fully represent it on a computer. And because of this, it means that all our models are wrong. It was George Box that said, all models are wrong, some are useful, but he's left us with that challenge of deciding which are useful. So to decide which model is useful, we need a definition of useful. And to me, that's models that facilitate making a decision in an uncertain situation. So if we take, for example, a water supply well and have some maximum level of concentration that's acceptable at the water supply well, of course, our question will be, well, what's the likelihood that we're going to exceed that concentration? And if we could take all the data that are available to us and think of all the possible ways that that could be interpreted and represented, and if it were possible to have enough computing power to represent all of those on alternatives on the computer, we could then calculate the expected concentration at the pumping well for all those cases and come up with a distribution, which might look like this, in which case we would say there's no problem. Any possibility that we can come up with, given the information we have, says that the concentration at the well will be lower than the acceptable limit, and so it's appropriate to proceed. Now, on the other hand, in another situation or another location, we might find that the concentrations we predict are above the maximum acceptable limit, in which case we would say, well, we need to change our plan. But in most cases, we find that the uncertainty is very broad, and it's not clearly above or below the acceptable concentration. We would like to be able to make an estimate of what the con concentration is expected to be and then have some uncertainty bounds on that. But what we typically get in our reports is one value, often to many significant figures. And if that person is pressed, they'll come up with a fairly narrow confidence interval because they'll use regression to base it on the fit to the observations and the sensitivity of their model to those locations. Sensitivity being how much does the simulated value change for a small change in the parameter values. Now the problem is that if I give the same data to another practitioner, that practitioner will build their own conceptual model and calibrate that. And it's quite likely that that conceptual model will not overlap with the first, and that the error bars won't even overlap, and that one practitioner may say that there's a, everything's fine, and the other may say that nothing's fine. 
If you don't believe that this actually happens, I'd like to give you an example from a group near, working near Copenhagen, Denmark. It's in a basin that's southwest of Copenhagen, and they have three different geological concepts of how the system is configured. Now they've taken all three of these and calibrated them and made predictions of concentrations for the next uh, 100 years and, uh, or 300 years and estimated what the concentration will be and what's the uncertainty based on those three models. Now, if I look at 40 years and show you the error bars in the way that we've just been viewing them, you can see that at the shallow location, all three models are in good agreement. But at the intermediate location, and particularly at the deep locations, the model error bars don't overlap. And so the question is, well, if we have these multiple models, which one do we believe? What do we present to the community? And that's the topic that we'll talk about for the next few minutes. First, let's talk about how we calculate those red confidence intervals on the predictions. So if we're using the nonlinear regression, like you code in PEST, then the confidence intervals will depend on the weighted residuals and the sensitivities at the optimum parameter values. So first, we calculate the uncertainty on the parameter values. So this V is the variance covariance matrix on the parameters that we've been estimating. So B represents the hydraulic conductivity, storage coefficient, recharge, heads, flow rates, whatever you estimate when you calibrate your model. And the diagonal of this matrix is actually their variances. And you know if we take the square root of the variance, we have a standard deviation, and we take plus or minus two of them around the parameter, it'll give us our 95% confidence intervals. So that variance is dependent on how well we fit our observations. So the sum of squared weighted residuals divided by the number of observations minus the number of parameters that we estimate times the inverse of our Jacobian. So what is this? This x is the sensitivities of our model to the observations, and the w is the weights on the observations. So the important thing here to notice is that as your model's sensitive to the observations and you know the observations accurately, these numbers get large. It's to the minus 1 power, so the variance on your parameter decreases as you get more sensitivity and more accurate observations and a better fit to the system. Now, I don't really care about the variance on my parameters. What I'm interested in is how that influences the variance on what I predict. So we can carry that forward to look at the standard deviation on a prediction. So Z is the prediction. That might be a water level, a flow rate, a concentration. And we run the model in the predictive mode and get the sensitivity of the prediction to our model and then coupling it here with the variance on the parameters, we can go through the computations. This ends up with the variant being the variance on the prediction, so we have to take its square root. And this standard deviation then, times 2 added and subtracted from the prediction, gives us the red confidence intervals that we've been talking about. So what we want to know is how do we get to these larger, broader confidence intervals? And I might mention we can calculate the confidence intervals in various ways. We can use nonlinear intervals. The U code, parameter estimation code, will do that now. We could use Monte Carlo sampling from parameter distributions to get these intervals. But no matter how we approach that, when we work with one model, those intervals are fairly narrow. So to look at the broad intervals, we really have to consider multiple conceptual models. And to talk about that, I've brought a synthetic model, because in that case, we will know the truth. And this synthetic model has a, a true heterogeneity, including five hydraulic conductivity zones that range in, in value from 1 to 25 meters per day. The darker the low conductivities and the lighter the high. So this system is really not very heterogeneous compared to most field sites. Uh, but you'll see how much different our predictions can come out when we try to model this system. It's two-dimensional, steady state, unconfined. There's no flow boundaries on the north, west, and south, and a river on the east with a tributary. There's distributed recharge over the top of the model and a pumping well in the south. So now we need some calibration data to work with. So I've taken 20 points from that simulation to represent 20 heads measured in the field. And then I've taken the outflow rate to this reach of river and an observation of advective transport for one in five years as if there was a spill here and it was characterized at one in five years. Now we also need a question to address. So we ask the question, will the spill reach the proposed municipal well? And we know the truth. The community is fairly certain that that will happen. 
But they ask, well, we have some parkland down by the river. If we pump and treat the water there, will that protect our well? Now, because we have a synthetic model, we can tell right away that it won't because I can track the capture zone for the municipal well, even with the remedial well pumping, and we can see we're still capturing the spill. But they don't know that, and let's look at how they might see this question. First, of course, we'd have to aggregate the truth, so we take this, the detailed system, and we coarsen it up to do our work. And then, in the field, we would look at many different alternatives. We'd look at different geologic frameworks, different initial and boundary conditions, different processes and scenarios, even solution algorithms or discretization processes. But for this example, we will just think about varying the geologic framework, and it will be as if each one of us took 112 geologic boring data, and we all know the spatial structure. I'll just put that out so that we have all very good models of the system. And to save us the time of doing that this afternoon, I brought a homogeneous model and 60 different models with two to five zones of hydraulic conductivity. And then these are all simulated with ModFlow 2000 and ModPath, and they're calibrated, and the predictions are assessed using UCODE 2005. So let's just consider one reasonable model. This is model 2C. It's already been calibrated and run in the predictive mode, so that generates the hydraulic head contours that you see here. It's a simple model with just two zones of hydraulic connectivity, a high and a low hydraulic connectivity zone. So when one asks, well, is the model reasonably calibrated, we usually look at data such as these, where we have observed versus simulated, should fall on a 45 degree line, that looks great. It doesn't always reveal a lot of the problems of the model though, so it's better to look at weighted residuals versus simulated equivalents. And this plot should fall, uh, form a narrow uniform band around zero. The data shown here would be, certainly be acceptable for a field calibration. Then we also look at the weighted residuals in space and time, and we want the large and small and the positive and negative here in black and white to be randomly distributed in space. So if a person looked at these calibration results, they would say that this is certainly an acceptable model. And the trouble is that it comes to the wrong conclusion about whether the municipal well is safe from the spill because it shows that the spill will not reach the municipal well. Now this model is actually good for some other things. If we look at the confidence interval on where the spill was after five years of pumping, the confidence intervals of the model include that true location. If we wanted to predict the drawdown on the pumping well in the south, we'd find that the, the predicted confidence intervals include the true drawdown. It doesn't quite capture the flow at the tributary, but it's not so far off. The true flow is 3,300, and the confidence intervals are 38 to 44, or to 49. And so this model could be used for some general assessment of the basin. What do those other 60 models predict? If we take each one of them, and we calibrate each one, and run it in the predictive mode, there are a couple of things that we notice about this at first. We notice that, well, two of the models won't converge in parameter estimation, and 20 of them yield unreasonable parameter values in that coarse grain materials had lower hydraulic conductivities than fine grain materials. Now, if we had only one model to cite and they fell in that category, we would have to keep working with that model until we got something reasonable. But we have 39 models that all converged and gave us reasonable values, so we'll consider those and first we'll order them by their calibration quality. So what do I mean by calibration quality? That's a balance of fit and parsimony. It was Einstein who said, make everything as simple as possible, but no simpler. And that's what we're striving for here. We're trying to make a, a model that'll fit the data without being too complex. And I like to use a thermometer to illustrate this. So if I had a new thermometer, was calibrating it against an accurate thermometer, so I took the height of fluid in my thermometer and measured the temperature, but I was a little sloppy, and so my data scattered like this. I could draw a straight line between each point and predict temperature like that, but I don't think any of you would be happy with that. You would prefer that I instead used a straight line fit to my data, and I get a R squared of 0.93 for that line. Now if I got a little zealous and tried a sixth order polynomial, I could get an R squared of 0.95. None of you would prefer me to use that model for predicting temperature, and that's because we have a good intuition for how thermometers behave. We don't have such a good intuition for how groundwater models behave, and it's hard to know when we've developed a model that is just fitting the noise instead of fitting the information about the system. And so we can use some information criteria to help us make that decision. There are a number of such criterion. I like to use AICC. It's the bias-corrected Akiiki's information criterion. 
Uh, but there are others, and the software I talked to you about at the end will allow you to use that or criterion that you develop yourself. So let's look at what's in here. They all start with 